How do we respond to misrepresentations of the Buddha's teaching? First of all, of course, we have to know the difference between what is right teaching and what is wrong teaching, what is a misrepresentation and what is the truth, which is, of course, not so easy, not so obvious. And it's important to note that it's only from the point of view of right view, right practice, that it's possible to actually differentiate between what is right and what is wrong, because otherwise, everyone who is making a mistake, who is wrong, who is not practicing correctly, not teaching correctly, will still think that they're doing correctly. One who has wrong view doesn't see that he has wrong view. He doesn't know that he's wrong. If he knew that he was wrong, he wouldn't have the wrong view. He wouldn't keep it. It's very common to hear the saying, we learn by mistakes. But do we actually learn by mistakes? When you're doing something wrongly, when you're making a mistake, do you learn from that? And isn't it possible to spend one's whole life making the same mistake over and over again without realizing? In fact, the wrong view is a kind of uh, enormous mistake that we've been making for hundreds and hundreds and thousands and aeons of lives. So do we learn from mistakes? This is to point out that when we have wrong view and when we don't know, we might think we are right, but it's only the one with right view, the one who is practicing correctly, who can tell the difference between what's right and what's wrong. But having said that, it doesn't mean that one who is not sotapanna, who doesn't have the right view of sotapanna, cannot judge, has no way of judging whether the teaching that is being taught somewhere else is correct or no, or whether it's whether it's possible that that will lead out of samsara or no. Because it's as simple as, when I practice in the way that they tell me to here, I see that it does not directly lead me to remove anger, remove greed, remove ignorance. For example, we've talked about it recently in other videos, the practice of simply concentrating on the sensation of breath cannot lead to removing anger, removing greed, removing ignorance. It does not lead to wisdom. Therefore, it is a wrong teaching. Wrong in terms of that it cannot be the teaching of the Buddha. So yes, it's possible to exercise some level of judgment in regard to what is right practice or wrong practice. And it is a big mistake to take everything on face value and sort of think that everything is correct, they all go the same way, all the roads lead to the top of the mountain. We have to be very careful in regard to this point because there are so many different teachers, so many different teachings, even, let's say, just within Theravada Buddhism. If you go to a few different monasteries, talk with a few different teachers, they will all claim to teach Mahasatipatthana, the practice of meditation that the Buddha taught. But within what they actually teach, there will be quite a lot of variation. So that's the first point to be careful about, not to just blindly stick to the first teacher we meet or the first type of meditation that we might try to practice, but to check it, test it, like test it on yourself, does it work or not? And the only way we can really test it if we, is if we have the solid reference point of the aim to remove ignorance, remove greed, remove anger from ourselves. And if this is not solidly our reference point, then we will not be able to tell the difference between what's right and what's wrong. Because for example, if we're just looking to feel better, then there are many types of meditation meditation techniques, for example, that will make us feel better, that will make us feel more calm or more happy or will improve our lives. But that does not mean that they are the Buddha's teaching. So it's only if we are very clear about our aim being to remove defilements from ourselves, to purify ourselves entirely, and to end suffering within ourselves, that we will see when a teaching works or doesn't work. Mostly what people tend to go looking for is not a solution to the problem of their lives, but rather just a temporary, quick, easy release of the pain of it. We want a painkiller. Ajahn told a story that when he was a child, he would often have a very bad toothache, and he would go to a pharmacist who would give him a little uh, pill or a, something, he doesn't remember exactly what it was, that he would put in his mouth and hold on his tooth, and then this immediately numbed the pain, it immediately brought release. But of course, the problem was still there. The tooth was still there, it was still rotten, or it was still having a cavity inside. And nothing whatsoever was solved. He just had a temporary release from the pain. But he had gone to the pharmacist for that, and he would come home and he would be happy with that. Another example is that it's like as if you were to go to the doctor with terrible pain in your stomach, and he were to give you 
very strong painkillers for your pain, so you get rid of the pain. But the doctor who does this is not a good doctor, because the pain could be a symptom of something more serious. Suppose you have cancer, such as cancer of the intestine or cancer of the uterus. The doctor who has given you these pills might think he is helping you, but in fact he's doing opposite. He's harming, because not only do you not solve the problem, but it's getting worse, and now because you have these pills and you feel better, you stop searching for a solution to it. You think you found the solution. So it's like that with misrepresentations of the teaching of the Buddha, of which there are many, many wrong meditations, many wrong teachings. We can practice wrong concentration, feel better, but while all the time still having defilements, still being full of problems that are not solved. And this is no problem for somebody who is just looking for a painkiller and isn't interested in removing defilements and going out of suffering. But it is a problem for one who is really serious in his aim of practicing for the goal of the Buddha's teachings. And in that sense, it really is a very great harm that is caused by wrong teachings. And that said, it doesn't mean that we have the right to become angry on account of that when we hear about misrepresentations or when we see people teaching wrongly. It's an interesting and easy trap to fall into this, thinking of the teachings as something that we know about and that we must defend and that we must protect and that it is not allowed to be taught wrongly. But of course, if we take it like that, we are totally wrong. And it's us who are now taking the teaching wrongly in that case, because it's not ours to defend. It's not ours to protect. It's literally impossible to change what others say or do. And also, if we ourselves do not know and see, then it's like the Buddha said, he would give examples of these people who say, only this is true, everything else is wrong. But they themselves do not know and see that only this is true and everything else is wrong. They go on the base of faith or on the base of logic or on the base of some kind of reasoning. But not knowing, not seeing, they say only this is true, everything else is wrong. Now, there, of course, part of the problem is that the view is wrong. And now, because you stubbornly, dogmatically stick to a wrong view, saying only this is true, everything else is wrong, then you will never be able to hear to understand the teaching. But it's the same for people practicing the Buddha's teaching, trying to understand this, trying to judge correctly the difference between right teachings and wrong teachings. If we ourselves do not know and see, and we stubbornly, dogmatically, fanatically stick to only this is true, everything else is wrong, then we're blocking ourselves as well. Because look, as soon as this teaching that we follow is undermined, we feel personally threatened, we feel obliged to defend it. We become personally involved in it. We've made a self with it. And by making a self with it, we go against that very teaching that we think we are defending and protecting. And it's only somebody who does not really know and see for himself, who has not seen Dhamma for himself, that will dogmatically stick to this teaching in this way. Because for one who knows and sees, it's like he doesn't need to prove to everybody that this is the truth and that only this is true and everything else is wrong. Because it's just like, for example, right now in front of me I see a white wall. And if somebody who's wearing sunglasses comes into the room and tells me that he's very sure that the wall is pink, I can tell him that the reason that he thinks the wall is pink is because he's wearing sunglasses, and if he removes the sunglasses, he will see it as white in the same way that I see it as white. But I definitely don't feel like offended or bothered by the fact that he thinks the wall is pink and he feels the need to tell me that the wall is pink. I don't need to go around proving to everybody who might be wearing sunglasses, that the wall is white and not pink, because I just see it as it is. And if others don't want to take off their sunglasses to see the wall as white, well, they will continue to think that the wall is pink for the rest of their lives, and there's nothing I can do about it. So yes, it's possible to exercise judgment in regard to what is the teaching of the Buddha and what is not the teaching of the Buddha. Yes, it is correct to say that it's wrong, if that's useful, to point out that a way of practicing is wrong, that a teaching is wrong, that an interpretation is wrong, or whatever. What is not correct is to be dogmatic, be fanatic, to take the teaching as ours to defend, and to become angry if anybody doesn't teach 
exactly what we see to be the truth. 